Welcome one, welcome all. Thank you for tuning in to Cedar Lee Radio, your guide to films playing at the Art House for the week of April 26th to May 2nd. My name is Aaron Spears. And I'm Dave Huffman. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing Family and Wild Nights with Emily. We'll also be discussing the potential streaming bubble coming our way and the continued ability of odd little documentaries to connect with audiences, as well as our Cedar Lee three picks for favorite biopics. We always like to start off the show with the last scene first. So, Dave, what is the last film you've seen? The last movie I saw was a film that we played here at the Cedar Lee last year that I didn't get to see, nor did a lot of other people because it didn't last very long. It was called Beast by oh, yes. Michael Pierce. Yeah. A great little thriller about a woman who may or may not be dating a man who is a, a beast. Yeah, a serial killer. <laughs> and it's it's a great film. Uh, I would really, uh, really recommend it. I, I watched it on Shudder, I think, but I think it's on Amazon Prime or one of those other things as well. Shudder's so. more like... Shutter is all genre, is genre. Yeah, okay. genre stuff, but they have I remember that being terribly genre-ish. Uh, though. The things that are on Shutter right now, like they even had, I think, Dogtooth on Shutter. So oh. it's, they have like stuff that isn't all just horror now. Okay, and they're doing a good job of kind of rotating around. I had a, a friend that had a Shutter subscription, so we were watching some stuff oh, on that okay. over the weekend, and that was one that I was like, oh, I actually wanted to see this, and uh, I'm glad I finally watched it because yeah. it was really, really good. I feel like it had some talk for like was it independent spirit award nominations or, or something yeah, like i think it might have gotten a few i don't say like those. lower tier awards yeah. but like the more un, un, unheralded awards i guess because right. like people were seeing it but yeah mm-hmm. it came and went really fast but yeah. it was another one of those that people that saw it uh even a, a, fellow, a manager used to work here really liked it yeah. he was like i just picked it at random and he's like yeah. looked interesting so well we gave it a shot we know how you can be a winner sometimes by picking a that's film true at random. yeah at random <laughs> he did a he did a roll the dice before mm-hmm. he even articulated that um I did an angry watch because I got, <laughs> I was so upset uh, and a little disappointed with the film fans in Cleveland that the Beach Bum did not stick oh, around in, in any mm-hmm. theater no. for more than like a week or two. I could not wait to watch it because I yeah. adore Harmony Corinne's career and his uh, choices over the years. As we mentioned on the show, like uh, about the Beach Bum, where like even if I don't love every movie he's made, I love that he's making movies yeah, and he's out there watching. poking people in the cinematic eye with a mm-hmm. stick the way he makes some of his movies. And I got wrapped up with the film festival as that was going on. And that was exactly when Beach Bum was right. like, came and went. It's like, damn it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I watched Spring Breakers oh, just to right. get in that Harmony Corinne Florida gotcha. mood uh, for the, <laughs> I don't know, it was like third or fourth time, I guess. Okay. And um, did you see Beach Bum? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So did he tie it in cinematically as like a Florida world that he's building of like, is there any... I, crossover there's nothing or direct, but Just it definitely setting? has that same, yeah, has okay. that same kind of, you know, obviously Florida color Florida palette. Setting. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's not, uh, it's interesting to have, you know, someone that were originally kind of identified with grungy sort of, you know, New York vibe and now having the second sort of, you know, wave of his career, which is Florida weirdos. Oh, yeah. So it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. He's kind of migrated different. a little yeah, bit because he also completely. had like that uh, Julian Donkey Boy gummo, mm-hmm. like yeah, it's rural awful. America yeah. setting too for mm-hmm. a while as well. So now he's down in that garish color palette of Florida, which yeah. seems like it, it fits uh, It fits really well. I, I would say that the two Beach Bum and Spring Breakers do exist in the same world, but... Uh, but there's no like character crossover no, not or cinematic universe going on there. Spring Breakers has a much more... Um, rapid fire kind of pace to it mm-hmm. than beach bump beach bumps a more you know a wandering wandering narrative. sort of yeah. you know yeah you know stoner uh, right right so mm-hmm. so the new films uh four new films that we'd opened last week uh, i think amazing grace is worth noting because it's one of those like we mentioned a lot last year 2018 when we started the podcast about the year of the documentaries and people really mm-hmm. responding to the right kind of documentaries and on the surface of it, a lot of the documentaries that were hits last year of RBG and Free Solo and uh, certain types where you're like, will those be a hit? Won't those be a hit? Because like RBG, we even mentioned, uh, I mean, this is the last time we'll mention it on the podcast, I think. <laughs> no, it won't. Last year, like it played at the film festival to like two or three screenings to like yeah. huge crowds. And we're like, you know, was it didn't even have a crowd left? And then it played and was like the most attended movie we had in 2018. Right. So it's really weird to me how certain documentaries that like we don't even see coming. Loving Vincent, the animated, you know, mm-hmm. documentary from a couple of years back. Sleeper hit. Sleeper hit. Like never would have guessed like, oh, yeah, there's a crowd for this one. You know, a, a lost concert documentary about Aretha Franklin yeah. recording a gospel album. I've been like, really? Maybe like one or two shows? Well, I be good, but you know, after whenever she passed and then the week after was the week after we showed the Blues Brothers. Right, you know, right, right. Because, you know, she's she's a 
music star. She's not a film star. So right, she right. didn't have a lot of well, iconic film things. That's a key scene and it's an iconic scene in that like, movie. There's one movie that yeah. really is Aretha yeah. Franklin. You yeah. know? So we played the Blues Brothers and so many people came out for that. Yeah. Uh, not just because they liked the Blues Brothers, but because they wanted to honor her. And so sure. this is another way for her fans Absolutely. to really come out and appreciate and, and honor her talent and finally see this film that they had heard about right. and never had ch- a chance to uh, see. I think it helps too because it was getting a lot of like NPR play when it oh, uh, yeah. first opened in New York and LA. So we had a lot of phone calls ahead of time and we were like, oh, this one might be another one mm-hmm. of those docs that yes. uh, I mean, not necessarily RBG levels for mm-hmm. like, you know, months and months of playing, but yeah. you know, the crowds are like passionate and but enthusiastic weekend, for it. It did very well. So yeah. mm-hmm. we've always, uh, off and on checked in, I think through the awards season, it was a lot more checking in on Netflix and their theatrical release strategies yes. and whatnot. But, uh, we also lamented the loss of Filmstruck when mm-hmm. that was, uh, closed its doors due to a corporate takeover of its parent company and, uh, Filmstruck 2.0. Yes, uh, that's what we'll call it. Call it. Well, no, it has a name. It's the Criterion Channel. Yeah. It's, it's back. <laughs> it's but we're going to call it Filmstruck 2.0. 2.0, right, just to confuse everybody. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned even a couple weeks ago, Ovid was starting up as like mm-hmm. kind of a collective of you know much more like independent distributors yep. trying to pool their resources. Um, there's it. I think the article I, I'd sent you was like, it's will the streaming bubble ever burst? Yeah. Or like, I mean, it's clearly getting to be a bubble is very gluttonous at this point with a number of, of outlets. Well, well, it's because, you know, for years people complained about the thing they didn't like about cable is you were paying whatever, hundred dollars a month for all these channels, all these channels. You only, you only watch like six or eight channels or whatever it is. And then, so you're paying for the golf channel that you've never watched or, you know, all (laughs) these, you know, religious channels that you never watched or whatever it is that you were paying for in your cable bill. And now because of streaming, you can kind of pick and choose like you can right. get your hbo subscription you can get your whatever you know and and uh each individual kind of channel if you will but at a certain point i think the one article we were reading was like you know death by a thousand cuts because yeah, if yeah. you subscribe to all nimed. the things and it really the price point is anywhere between like five and fifteen dollars for some of these yeah, channels yeah. and you know that's it's too expensive at a certain point. You right. can't get everything you want because then you're like, well, I should have just kept cable. So it right, doesn't, yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> doesn't really make sense. But the, uh, you know, now with between criteria, criterion, of course, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon prime, uh, shutter, you just shutter that I just movie. Say, right. And there's canopy, the free one. Through. Right, right, right. So, and Disney plus is about to happen. Apple's and Apple the, and the Warner brothers is going to have their own. Oh God, so, yeah. Warner brothers. Too. <laughs> so it'll be very interesting when Warner brothers happens because Warner brothers has the huge classic film library right. too. It'll be very yeah. curious to see like if that becomes a sort of rival of, you know, a lot of the things that were on Turner classic movies, those right. are mostly from the Warner brothers, uh, library. Warner archives, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that if they kind of play up with that, um, you know, uh, with that library. And we mentioned on the previous episode about trying to find physical media for like, you know, law, even recent films that just, you know, are, are smaller mm-hmm. films that don't have the budget to put out physical media. The Warner Archive, uh, you and I were both fans of because you could just order. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll just like, oh yeah, we'll make you this DVD. Yep. It kind of came in a very plain kind of packaging and all that but you know you had a physical copy of that mm-hmm. thing that you th- i thought was like that's a lost movie i can get mother's jugs and speed on, on <laughs> dvd thanks warner brothers <laughs> but the uh i was kind of wondering if there's ever going to be a time because these are all like giant media conglomerates now they're yep. doing their own streaming like cbs has their own streaming thing like i said warner brothers mm-hmm. disney um apple starting up i don't think there's ever going to be an umbrella company that can come around now and be like all right if you want just Criterion and Ovid and Netflix and Hulu go with this company and it's 50 bucks. Yeah. And you just have all that. So like, we're just going to see a rebirth it, of a new type it, of I think that it will cable company. Kind of like, um, oh, why am I forgetting the name of the, uh, uh, the sling like that's oh, kind of TV. what oh, sling yeah, TV. Yeah, it is it kind of, it kind is of doing that with with cable channels right. traditional cable channels so i wouldn't be surprised if there ends up being like sling film or a, something, right a yeah. sort of bundling yeah. of all these programs where you're still kind of getting to pick and choose but maybe saving a few bucks by right. putting them all together because and then we're just, it's going to be cable 2.0 is yeah all it really would be yeah be. so it's which would be handier because like at this point we have four or five just at our house mm-hmm. and then like we'll go i'll go to one and i'll search no. for 15 minutes so it's like i oh, swear i put it yep. oh it's in my queue over in this other app yep. and oh and then it's like well now i don't have any more time to watch something because i just spent 45 minutes scrolling through scrolling trying through to stuff. find it yep. yeah absolutely no, that's what we always do like we tend to like we'll start at prime i think it's on there nope oh it must be on this nope it's on that so yeah. we have to keep logging out and logging back in yeah and that's what's nice if uh, i have a tivo and what's nice about tivo tivo wow that's a flashback well but the thing is the reason tivo still exists is because they own the patent on all of the dvr technology oh, and the tivo service okay. is a hundred percent worth paying for because TiVo, the new TiVo, yeah. links up with all those. So, like when you're on oh, your TiVo, 
Yeah. When you if you're on TiVo and you search and you type in whatever the movie is. Oh, it just tells you right where it's at. It immediately just brings oh. up like, oh, you want to watch blah, 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 blah. Here it is. And right. then it gives you the selection. And if you have a whatever, a voodoo, you know, membership or right, right. You know, whatever the streaming you just thing go right is, to there and see it, it just goes right there. So <sighs> it comes in very handy and it kind of does that. It functions as your one stop shop. Oh, OK. Mm hmm. Dang, I was going to end this segment by saying, Dave, we should quit our jobs and invent this thing that <laughs> doesn't exist, exist yet and make a million dollars. But It exists. It's called TiVo. All right. And people still kind of make fun of TiVo. I but, was doing it right now. But everybody, it's because yeah. TiVo kind of became in the background. They were the first ones out there, but then they just licensed all of their stuff the tech, to all so, the cable companies. Yeah. So that's what keeps them afloat. But they, Makes sense. their product themselves is actually a very good product. All right. So, there you go. Uh, we'll be right back with the two new films we are opening this week. This week, we only have one special event to let you know about. We are showing the film, the documentary film, Who Will Write Our History, on May 1st and 2nd. On May 1st, it'll be playing at 7 p.m. On May 2nd, it'll be playing at 2 p.m. Uh, this film was actually featured last year during the Cleveland uh, Mandel JCC Jewish Film Festival uh, last fall. So if you did not see it then, uh, here's your opportunity to come back out and see it on the big screen. <laughs> The first new film we have opening this week is the debut feature film from writer-director Laura Steinel. It is the film Family. Workaholic Kate is tasked with babysitting her awkward niece Maddie, and things go from bad to worse when Maddie runs off to join the Juggalos. I'm watching my niece for the week. She's strange. I think she prefers being alone and making weapons of nature. Actually, we're going to need you to stay just a little bit longer. Time to put your mommy hat on. We had an incident earlier with bullying. I hope you're not encouraging her to fight back. You just gotta fight back. Of course not. And you got her a dress for the dance tomorrow? I wanna wear a dress! We couldn't let her in. She wasn't wearing formal attire. She was wearing a suit and she was wearing a cape. I don't know what could be more formal than that. I guess we should start off just right away with <laughs> who both the Juggalos are for those who <laughs> for aren't our, devoutly well, following the Insane Clown Posse. I love the fact that this is, I'm, I'm assuming, the first film that we've ever played here at the Cedar Lead that features the gathering of the Juggalos. Ooh, I, I that's think a it, good question. I think it probably it has is. To be, I think. And uh, the Juggalos are what the fans of the band, the Insane Clown Posse, uh, call themselves. And if you've never... If you're not familiar with the Insane Clown Posse, well, first, I envy you. Yeah. And then second, <laughs> I, also I don't envy you for a YouTube search you should probably do just to I see a couple say, videos. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just focus your YouTube search and just watch their video for the song Miracles, which is amazing and how terrible it is. And it's all about, uh, you know, science and, you know, like how do magnets work? I mean, it's just the most insane thing. I would say we'll put the link in the show notes, but I don't really want to promote the insane. No, we don't. So just search it on your own. I was I was trapped one night at home with a friend who is a juggalo. No, made me go down like an ironic uh, ICP wormhole, we'll call it. And it was it was eye opening and terrifying I bet. and yeah so yeah. anyway but this film is kind of like it's used uh, as a comedic device in this film for a reason it is, I think. yes yeah uh, it is uh, about this you know like you said this aunt that is not a person that it should ever be in charge of a, a child not not like in an uncle buck sort of way right she's you know she's a competent <laughs> uh you know successful person right but she just doesn't have any time for kids she's so focused on her career yeah. she doesn't care about other people's feelings or emotions she's just like me 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 kind of life right and uh so now she's put out in in this suburban home watching her her niece for a few days while the her brother goes off for a uh, family emergency and you know her, her daughter or the the niece meets up with um a juggalo this kid like you know and <laughs> and she's sort of struggling to find her way you know right. sure her mom makes her take ballet classes but she really wants to take karate you know she's not the kid that her mom wants her yeah to she's be. not fit into that mold right. so yeah. you know and under the ants not very attentive watchful eye right who keeps like driving off and forgetting she even was in charge of a kid you know, <laughs> right like, oh i love the kid back at the mini mart Whoops. you know that's the kind of competent <laughs> adult she yeah is. yeah and uh you know she meets up with this juggalo and ends up like you know, going to the, you know, the, the, the mom and the dad and the aunt all have to try to find the niece ultimately at the gathering, at the of, gathering the Juggalos, of Juggalos, nice. which is a great scene. This yeah. is, like I said, it has a lot of familiar elements that you've seen. I compared it to Uncle Buck, you know, where you have like the incompetent kind of adult put yeah. in charge of kids. And, and comedy ensues. And comedy ensues. So you've definitely have seen elements of this film before, but it is pretty funny. And I enjoyed, uh, again, just anytime people can make some cheap 
jokes at the expense of the juggalos i'm all for it. right so there, you go. <laughs> there was a quote from uh john defore who writes for the hollywood reporter that said he, watching this film he realized the hitherto unknown potential of the insane clown posse to enable a young girl's emotional growth <laughs> <laughs> which i thought was a great way to word that because nobody's thinking about that and when that they think a, about the juggalos at all true no i mean you know i i don't want to belittle other people's fandom and stuff because it is the one thing that you will say about that it is just like any kind of band you know people are all together and they have this great kind of affinity for the same thing and the same right, right right so they're all having fun it brings a certain and, personality type together and, but and you know they describe it in the film as like imagine the gathering of the worst people on earth and multiply by a thousand <laughs> you know that's how like someone describes the gathering of the juggalos but they're just people having fun drinking fago and having you know right, stupid crazy fun face out in the paint field. and yeah. everything yeah so it's just it's you know it looks it's you know looks scarier than it is right right so, there you go we should also mention too it stars uh taylor schilling from mm-hmm. orange is the new black yes. which is i wanted to ask you because you've seen family already the mm-hmm. tone for Orange is the New Black, I've only seen the first two seasons of it, um, but it had a really interesting balance to me of like, I mean, I, I guess I was told it was a comedy at first. And I was uh-huh. like, it is a comedy, but it's a very interesting kind of tone for a comedy. Uh, does that kind of translate it all here? Like, is that her, kind of her comedy style as an yes, actress? I would say so. You can see that she definitely has that sort of, you know, kind of hard kind of bitch edge to her in some ways that's you know? weird and, yeah, yeah yeah and uh, but you know and a bite to it and a bite yeah. to it so it, it's, it's it's she does a great job in it and it's very fun but she's not like if you're a fan of Orange is the New Black and her acting in that one this isn't some sort of like radical departure no, to like no, you can, slapstick you or... can see why she got cast in it okay yeah, yeah it makes sense yeah, it makes sense and then the other film we're opening up this week is Wild Nights with Emily, another comedy. It's unusual for us to have two comedies yeah. opening at the Cedarly. And that is directed by Madeline Olnick. And it is about the life of Emily Dickinson as told through her uh, letters to who was her lover at the time. When Emily was a young girl, Emily did have a fondness for the daughter of a tavern keeper, Susan. Susan is to be married. I care for your brother, but my heart belongs only to you. (laughs) I missed you. Susan, you have to be careful. You are the one who writes the poems. What's it in ink? Every poet has a muse. These are for you. One cup flour, add milk. It's on the other side. I, I was thinking this was just like a comedic reinterpretation of Emily Dickinson. I don't know her life all yeah. that well, but in reading up on it, I was like, oh. Well, it's one of those things that, you know, history kind of buried. They literally took yeah. uh, an eraser to the letters and changed the name to keep the gender of who she was writing all these love letters to, you know, were falsely changed to a male, uh, you know, so, but she was writing these love letters to uh, to a woman. Was it her? Her, her sister-in-law. S- sister-in-law, yeah. yeah. Her, 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 um, her lover married her brother, and then they they could still see each other. Right. But it was, you know, obviously a strenuous kind of thing. Right, yeah. But they, you know, their kids, like her daughter was very aware of what was going on. Like she knew who her aunt was to her mom. Okay. And, and the relationship, like they it was secret but out in the open. You right, know right, I mean? right, yeah. And, and it was, uh, you know, it's a very funny movie, but not like joke funny. You know, Molly right, Shannon right. is the lead, and Madeline Olnick, whose other films include... One of my favorite film titles of all time, which is Codependent Lesbian Space Alien Seek Same, which we showed uh, over at the Capitol, I think almost, oh, it was like 2011 or 2012, whenever that was playing. Yeah. And it's a really funny movie. Her other movies are much kind of broader lesbian comedies. This one has a very different tone from her other films, although she does have some of the same cast members that she's been working with. This is the first time she's had kind of a, a bigger name star in one of her movies with with Molly Shannon. But it's a, a really good movie. And it just played at the film festival. Uh, at downtown and now we're bringing it back here to the uh, Cedar Lee so I hope people will come out and see it this one is uh, based on a play that she'd written as well Uh, the director Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to mispronounce the last name I'll let you just say Olnick thank you Mm -hmm. Madeline Olnick Uh, we'll be right back with our Cedar Lee 3 picks for this week inspired by Wild Nights with Emily So each week we like to take inspiration from one of the new films opening and suggest three films to broaden your cinematic horizons. And with the release of Wild Nights with Emily, we decided to take a look at biopics, which we show a lot we show a of lot. those. And I can't believe we haven't done that topic <laughs> yet. So that was weird when you uh, sent me the email. I was like, oh, bi- I just, in my head, I was like, we, we already, already did that done one. That. 
Well, uh, it's amazing how many biopics come out every year. Like, you don't even realize that some things are technically biopics. Right, know? right. But anything that is really sort of like based on a true story, I guess, in a way. Kind of as a biopic, yeah. Because like my first few internet searches, I was like, okay, this is way, yeah. way too much. And I just looked at like what we showed here last year. And I was like, there's like 40. Like, yeah. it's, it's pretty nuts how uh, wide, wide a net you can cast with biopics. Well, so when you talk about that, like looking at films that we showed here, um, two of my three films, you know, I don't know if the third one played here because it was uh, before my time here, even in Cleveland. So I'm not sure if it played here. But the first one on my list, I would say if we were going to do the Mount Rushmore of cedarly iconic films Ooh. or most successful films of the last decade or 15 years. Now I'm curious what this uh, is. Is La Vie on Rose. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. So yeah, yeah. Um, the by uh, Olivier Dahan. And it's, uh, you know, the biopic of Edith Piaf starring Oscar winner Marion Cotillard. And it is just a beautiful movie that played for a long time here. I remember we had a woman that came to see it. I ran into her in the lobby the one time and I think it was like her 40th time seeing it, she had told me. So I say technically, I think what the word you're looking for is it played here forever. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, it was definitely one yeah. of those uh, films that just really connected here, and uh, for a reason because it's a really well done, beautiful movie filled with great music. Yeah, I think it's uh, the Americans' first introduction to Marianne Cotillard too as an actress. Yep. Was, I certainly didn't know uh, who she was before that one. And what is your first biopic? I'm going to go with uh, Ed Wood from 1994. It was on my list as uh, well. Well, it can still be on your list. That's I know, <laughs> but I'm just saying it is. Um, that, for some reason, was the first ones I thought of when I said uh -huh. when we were saying biopics because yep. it's my favorite Tim Burton movie and it's... Uh, it's one of those like I th it, probably a near perfect movie like there's no scene in there that needs cut out it's mm -hmm. like so perfectly framed and just the, the gamut tone of it is exactly tone right is from perfect. beginning to end because it yeah. also feels like it's shot like an Ed Wood movie yep. for the most part but it works and it's yeah. almost this like one-ups gamesmanship of like yeah you had all the elements there you just do it better. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sorry, when he, that's Tim Burton talking to Edward in a fictional <laughs> universe in my head. And uh, he did that with uh, yeah. an amazing performance from, um, oh, shoot. Johnny Depp and. Not Johnny uh, Depp. Well, uh, but Martin his, Landau is who I was thinking of. Johnny Depp's performance is amazing. It is, too. it is. He didn't win an Oscar. No, like, he didn't. Uh, but, you know, but it was still a very good performance. Yeah, no, it really is, actually, because it's. Uh, Johnny Depp in my head is just like a gimmick actor, but like that's one of his best gimmick performances. Oh, he's so great in that, that movie. Uh, you know, it absolutely works. And the, the fact that. Um, I don't. It just always boggled me that the fact that you can have a film made in the exact style of Ed Wood, but it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Is uh, it just? It's yeah. always been a. It is a great, great movie, and that's the one that I wasn't sure if it did or did not play here at the Cedar Lee. We'd have to look back at the records. Ooh, that's a good point. Because it did play yeah. mostly kind of art house specialty theaters to start with, and then expanded right, right. a little bit. It was one of those things that the studio weirdly, you know, it's it's a Disney movie. Disney owns it. Oh, that's right. So, like, oh my God, that's right. It's, it's 25th anniversary, and I would love to show it. Yeah, but Disney will not allow us to show it. Boo. So yeah, Disney has very strange rules. About Wait, so Tim Burton's relationship with Disney really goes back yeah. a ways. Then okay, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's uh, I think it was a Touchstone picture. Whenever oh, they had technical that. Disney movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When they yep, had that sub label, but it is, um, you know, it's a great movie. Martin Landau's fantastic, mm -hmm. and Bill Murray actually. Back in college, oh, that's right. there was uh, a, a set of Ed Wood collectible cards that came out. Yeah, like yeah. Some, someone did those. And uh, my best friend from college, RJ, and I sat there, and we hypothetically like were casting, like, who would we cast oh, to play yes, this? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And we actually got Bill Murray correct. Oh, really? Like, yeah, it was the only nice. person like at the time. <laughs> Johnny Depp wasn't really on anyone's radar as a movie star at that point. No, but, no, not know, yet. But it was funny just to have kind of, you know, a couple of the people that we said, right. hypothetically, if we made the movie, actually ended up being in the That's movie. Sure. So look there at us. Go. I guess I should have been a casting director. Just for that one time. Just for that one time, <laughs> I got it right. Well, the next film on my list, since we both had Ed Wood, yeah. is uh, a film called Control, which is the biopic of the original lead singer of... Um, uh, Joy Division. Joy Division. Thank you. I almost said New Order. That's why. It's oh, like, right. Because yeah. <laughs> they morphed into New Order. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ian Curtis, uh, played by Sam Riley, is directed by Anton Corbain. And it's just a awesome black and white biopic of this brilliant young talent in uh, late 70s and uh, early 80s England that, you know, kind of burnt out very, very, very young, young yeah. yeah, and left a legacy of music behind him. But, you know, 
it's it's a sad story. And then, uh, you know, and Anton Corbain is the perfect person to direct that movie because he was a music director, or a music video director yeah. from the 80s, like working with bands like Depeche Mode, basically from that same period, on, right, right. a little few years later. But, you know, so he is of that period, of that element. And right. that's why I think that film works so well, because he just captured it perfectly. Well, I knew the knew the terrain quite well. He so. absolutely knew the terrain. And if you if you missed uh, Control, that is one that played here at the Cedar Lee, and it it's was. a great, great movie. Uh, mine. Oh, so now we're. Do we used up all your? Yeah, we concerning? used up. All oh, mine. okay. I'll make up another one. Well, no, but, you uh, know, there's there's no shortage. There's no biotech. shortage. That's true. Yeah. Um, I was gonna go with uh, Aaron Brockovich for one of mine, oh, which is uh, almost on my activist list last year. Or last oh, really? Last, yeah, oh, yeah. Two weeks ago, whenever we did that. Uh, it's the story of Aaron Brockovich Ellis, who. Uh, well, people know that story. I'm sure mm-hmm. by this point. That's uh, from 2000. This was though. You got to place yourself in the 2000s mindset of where Steven Soderbergh's career was before this like he had already kind of um burnt out in the hollywood system mm-hmm. he went off and made schizopolis and then in 1999 he returned with the limey one of my favorite steven soderbergh movies and then in two, so 99 limey in 2000 he did both aaron brockovich and traffic mm. which yeah, uh traffic really kind of brought him back to everybody's yeah. like the critical faves but they were also both audience uh hits as well um but i picked this one mainly because it's one of those you know, people know who Ed Wood is. People, um, you know, know Joy Division. They know, well, my my last pick as well. But nobody knew who Aaron Brockovich Ellis right. was at the time. It was one of those, like, unsung heroes that don't usually get biopic treatment. And it's not a full, like, her whole life story. It's like a very narrow little bit of, uh, you know, of her life story and what can happen when you're just a determined, caring individual who wants to make a difference and improve the environment around you. And uh, Dave, what is your last one since I stole uh, Since stole you stole Edward from, from me, that's okay. Uh, the last one I'm going to talk about is Alex Cox's great, great film, Sid and Nancy. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you've never seen Sid and Nancy... Uh, you you hit my punk buttons from, yes, from last week exactly. there. Um, you know, it's all about Sid Vicious and it's uh, got a fantastic performance by uh, uh, Gary Oldman as Sid Vicious. Which, Ferocious. For, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It is just a fantastic movie. So uh, I would highly, highly, highly recommend watching that one. Not, I haven't seen that in a while, but not as heavy on the music. No. Of the sex, but it's more no, just it's, like it's the, the lifestyle. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, yeah, it's that, like a, I would say romantic comedy. Yeah. It's not a comedy. It's a, yeah. Romantic tragedy. Right. It, but that's what the film really focuses on. Uh, yeah. That's why it's called Sid and Nancy. Right, right. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not called Sid, you right? Know, it's Sid and Nancy. <laughs> so it is. It's a kind of a love story biopic. My final one is um, I went with uh, all I wrote down was vanity with an exclamation point because <laughs> I love this movie and I saw it in um, film school and it was a teacher that I had that was telling us about you know how you can embrace pretension and uh, you know that doesn't have to be like a negative thing. Um, so the one I went with is uh, all that jazz from 1979, oh, yeah. which is awesome. About Bob Fosse, mm-hmm. written by Bob Fosse, directed by Bob Fosse. He just didn't act the part is the mm-hmm. only thing that's missing here. He has uh, Roy Scheider and Oh, that might be one of my favorite Roy Scheider parts, actually. He did so many great ones in the 70s. Yeah. But um, That's a great movie. It's about uh, Bob Fosse in his whole career, but told in like a crazy like fever dream style mm-hmm. by the end that uh, just... It's incredibly cinematic. It's very cinematic, yeah. yeah. It is a big screen movie. Right, right. So, yeah. And it's, it's so... It was... De- Debatable, like unconventional musical, but like since his life itself is was like musical, so yeah. in the musical mm-hmm. as well that um, it does. I mean, it hits all like the regular musical buttons, I guess. But it's um, such a. It's also as like it's it's a product of its time too. That it's a seventies, you know, kind of hallucinatory, trippy <laughs> version of like you know what the life of a choreographer is like. But yeah. he was also a larger than life figure mm-hmm. within you know live musical theater as well. That mm-hmm. um, it's kind of nice though that he doesn't really shy away from some of the more like you know, controversial elements of uh, his career and whatnot. I'm just, I'm fascinated by him as someone that started as a dancer and a choreographer that became this just tremendous filmmaker too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like that's, I mean, there are other choreographers that became filmmakers. He's not the only one. But, right, right. But, but he was able his, to transition his, and it's not, right, you don't like, watch his movies just because of the choreography. Yeah. It's like he's able to get great performances out yeah. of people and the visual eye that he has, mm-hmm. um, you wouldn't think would translate from stage, but I guess it kind of does because you're worried about blocking and set mm-hmm. design and stage lighting that, yeah, now it just opens up to a bigger canvas when you're out working with film. Yeah, so. absolutely. On next week's episode, we'll be discussing films as of right now are set to open at the theater. Ask Dr. Ruth, Sunset, 
Hesburg and Her Smell. So next week, Cedarly 3 will be inspired by Her Smell, in which uh, Elizabeth Moss is playing a self-destructive punk rocker as she struggles with sobriety and trying to recapture her creative inspiration that led to her band's initial success. We're going to take a look at self-destructive characters. So submit your picks if you have a favorite film with a self-destructive character. Sid and Nancy's already taken. We just used that this week, so <laughs> that one's off limits. Uh, submit any picks you want to recommend at Cedarly Theater using the hashtag Cedarly 3, the number three. As always, thank you for tuning in to Cedarly Radio and lending us your ears this week. All the music heard on the show is original music written by Grant Heinemann and performed by the New Heights Jazz Ensemble, used with their permission, of course. Visit clevelandcinemas.com for correct showtimes and to purchase advanced tickets. Also, there are links in the show notes. You can use those if you'd like as well. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at Cedarly Theater, spelled with an R-E at the end because we're fancy like that. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcast. And while you're subscribing, leave us a rating and review or better yet, tell a fellow film geek about the show. We'll see you at the movies.